in the old, uh, it hasn't resonated with all of our customers. So Paul, uh, we've all read uh, Net Positive. Uh, I don't know if you all can see this, uh, which is a fascinating book. It covers, uh, it covers territory that uh, we were familiar with uh, from your uh, uh, tenure at Unilever, uh, but really sort of brings uh, uh, that experience to life uh, for us. Uh, we read about uh, sustainable businesses in the abstract. Uh, you led a sustainable business, and when we say business, it's a business that is easily one of the most global uh, companies in, in the history of the world. Uh, supply chains that uh, run into uh, thousands and thousands of uh, you know, different enterprises and different materials and different sources. So um, I think we're getting uh, uh, um, a, sort of a, a mixed response from the different stakeholders. Let's turn the floor over to you, Paul. Any reactions? I know that a lot has been dropped uh, from the different uh, constituencies. We'd love to hear you and uh, any reactions to what you heard. And of course, we'd love to learn uh, more about what went behind the book. No, with, uh, with pleasure. And, and I listened with uh, interest. And uh, Bhaskar, I must say, it's getting better every year. And I always look forward to it. And here again, the the students have uh, exceeded my expectations you know it is um, uh, great actually the way you structure your class to have um, these opposing views uh, where you really have to be contrarian one way or the other it doesn't matter if you're on the for or against side but you're forcing this bifurcation of opinion and, and obviously the reality of life is that there are lots of shades in between um, a lot of the arguments for you need to be careful that you don't become or believe in yourself and, and become your biggest uh, own supporter without having the fundamentals to back it up or, or the proofs or, or the assurance uh, that it is good for the business. And on the other hand, uh, with a lot of the skeptics, uh, I notice that a lot of the arguments are a little bit stretched or, or based on premises that frankly, um, uh, uh, miss uh, 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 a solid um, argumentation. Um, so, so the reality of the world is always a little bit gray. Uh, not all consumers, for example, are willing to pay more, but increasingly more consumers are willing to pay for things beyond product performance. Uh, you see that happening in many of the markets, like um, like the food market, which is rapidly transforming, like the electric vehicle market which is uh, taking off like the market for green energy. So um, whilst these trends are happening and these trends are accelerating, it doesn't mean that it's black and white. The same as the shareholders. Whilst undoubtedly more shareholders are now looking for a more responsible corporate behavior, they've rapidly moved from seeing uh, ESG as risk mitigation uh, to uh, opportunity seizing. You pointed out the $12 trillion we had in our report. These numbers subsequently have gone up. Um, there are still investors uh, that uh, I wouldn't call them shareholders. I'd call them share speculators that have a better, an other short-term interest and frankly don't care of the role that society, that companies play in society. So in each of these categories of stakeholders, just to mention these two, you see... Um, people at uh, different sides of the spectrum. But I would argue overwhelmingly it's moving in the direction that we sort of anticipated in 2009, 2010. The, the thing that has changed dramatically is two things. Um, what makes me a little bit more confident is um, the first thing, regretfully, is that the world needs it. People have realized that we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. Increasingly, more of all of our stakeholders are suffering from the terrible issues of climate change or inequality and making their dissatisfaction known at bigger numbers. You look at the great resignation in the US, you look at uh, uh, people putting their money behind sustainable brands, you look at um, uh, people in the street voicing their dissatisfaction at the polls and, and choosing from politicians. Um, so uh, most importantly, actually in companies itself, where the pressure of employees is beyond what we've ever seen before. Uh, many companies dealing with strikes or walkouts of employees, which would have been unheard of four or five years ago. We also see the regulatory environment moving 
very quickly in most parts of the world. Even the US where things have trailed a little bit, where Wall Street has still a little bit more of a dominance than here in Europe. People have understood that the myoptic focus of shareholder returns alone has not really helped the economy. Um, it was masked uh, by uh, overall growth of the economy, by globalization, by companies expanding, and things were going well. But uh, people increasingly realize uh, that um, if you don't take care of your multiple stakeholders, it's difficult to build value over the longer term. We've seen in the US the number of publicly traded companies uh, reduced by half over the last uh, five decades. We see the length of a publicly traded company having come down its life from 67 years to now less than 17 years. Uh, we see increasingly the short-term behavior of companies um, at the debt of the environment or of of building a more equitable or more inclusive growth. So I think people are turning away from that model uh, and are trying to look for alternatives. The challenge is, as one of you said, it is um, the challenge is that we can only optimize so much within a current system um, uh, to get the results that we require. These are major systems changes that are needed to really ensure that business itself is successful long term which is very important and has a good return and has profits so that it can do more of what it should be doing and at the same time um, uh, as it strives for for those uh, returns um, that we we discover increasingly that optimizing within the current system doesn't get us there anymore that we have to drive the broader systems changes and this is where the challenge is it's the challenges in that partnership that is needed between the different actors civil society governments private sector uh, to get to these bigger changes unilever never pretended to do things alone never pretended that it had more influence than consumers or other things. The only thing that Unilever did, as I explain in my book, Net Positive, is it, it took first and foremost, um, uh, it created first and foremost awareness of the issues that the world is dealing with. You cannot run a business longer term by denying the realities of the environment in which you operate. Business cannot succeed in societies that fail. Climate change is affecting consumers, but it's affecting every business as well. Uh, the economic uh, geopolitical tension that we see, now the terrible war in the Ukraine, is also affecting all businesses. So business cannot uh, distance itself from a system that gives them life in the first place. So uh, for us, it is important that business in, indeed has that high awareness as a first step of what is going on very few businesses actually have that awareness to that level. The second thing is, it's not that we are pretentious to come back to the consumer side of, um, of telling consumers what to do or not to do. No, it's actually taking responsibility of your total impact in society, as I explain in the book Net Positive. It is irresponsible to have business models out there that are designed to make the world worse uh, when the world is in desperate need to make it better. It is irresponsible for businesses to not take responsibility of their unintended or intended consequences beyond their direct control. It's great that Facebook has lots of followers, but if it doesn't take responsibility for child addiction on their platforms or, or hate speech or uh, child pornography, if you want to, then consumers are ultimately going to reject it. It's not different from Unilever. If we don't take responsibility for um, deforestation, or the poor livelihoods of smallholder farmers or the food waste, we are not doing our job either. And interestingly, by taking that broader responsibility, uh, it forces you to work in partnership exactly with civil society, with all the other stakeholders. It forces you to understand these issues deeper, which then get reflected in bigger and better innovations to address them, more of a reflection of the reality of the world you're serving, and ultimately that gets translated into uh, better business results. The challenges are, are big and that's uh, why it's not easy. Um, many companies are not willing to take that broader responsibility. Many CEOs are not willing to set the real targets that are needed, that society depends on. And I'll come back to that. Many CEOs 
feel very uncomfortable to work in these broader partnerships. And then at the same time, we have the major distractions, uh, COVID, um, the geopolitical tension, um, the, the politicians that we now elect, exactly because we're not addressing these issues, by the way, but have become more nationalistic, xenophobic, uh, populist, and are really um, in the major countries paying lip service to some of these uh, bigger challenges. All that makes it business, for business more difficult to move forward. Um, all of that um, requires us not only to um, uh, st uh, uh, charter our own course as a company, but more importantly, require us to create critical masses of, of uh, companies or of organizations that understand the need for this change. And fortunately, that is growing increasingly to drive these tipping points to, to achieve these broader systems changes. So that's really the process that we're in right now. And, and we're being challenged. COVID uh, threw a monkey wrench in there. It forced a lot of governments to focus on saving lives and livelihoods and distracted from other things. That money that was spent on COVID is infinitely more than what we would have to spend on solving these issues in the first place, um, which I think has made people realize that we can act quickly on big issues if we work together, the development of the vaccine, an example, but it has also made people realize that the cost of not acting is now becoming higher than the cost of acting. We are at such a point in humanity that because we haven't addressed these major issues, business, society itself are incurring costs that are two to three times higher than the benefits of if we would address these issues. You take uh, food, the whole food supply chain, linked to deforestation, linked to methane, linked to enormous amounts of waste. Um, that alone has a negative cost for society that is estimated at $12 trillion. You could turn that into a regenerative agricultural system, for example, where you protect the forest, where you restore the health of the land, where you ensure that you reduce your food waste and you create a positive $4 trillion benefit for the economy. That's a swing from a negative 12 trillion to a positive 4 trillion of 16 trillion alone by redesigning our food system. The cost of that, only $50 billion a year. The effects of that, immediate. If we all start changing our diets and use alternative proteins than animal proteins, for example, it's probably the biggest immediate effect on climate change. The cost of that, negligent, frankly negligent. Uh, and, uh, and the same you see in, in other areas now uh, where people have discovered that, that uh, once more the cost of not acting has become significantly higher than the cost of acting. And this, I think, is the fundamental reason why you see the financial market getting interested, why increasingly governments are starting to move, uh, why companies are uh, making bolder commitments and trying to position themselves uh, better for the future. And we're at that point right now that um, the voices of the ones that don't, that want to protect their own self-interest, the status quo, some of the bigger energy companies, oil companies, uh, some of uh, other industries where people don't have a interest to change their current business models because it's them well, uh, you see that level of opposition becoming more focal and actually becoming more dangerous. The war in the Ukraine has given a lot of ammunition to the fossil industry to say we need to drill more holes. Energy prices are too high. It's a very popular argument right now, short term with consumers. We need to go uh, start fracking again. We need to open new wells. But that would be a tremendous disaster if we believe in the climate science, which now 95% of the world population does. Uh, we see the food crisis in the Ukraine and Russia and uh, people saying, oops, we uh, risk having more people go to bed hungry. So we need to cut down more forests to plant more fields and create more food. Also, that would be devastating and result in millions of more people dying a little bit further down the line. So it's these balances of these immediate short-term interest by some people, often linked to election cycles, often linked to CEO compensation, often linked to pressure from boards that are more short term than people give them credit for, if I may say, 
that is a tension field that you need to deal with whilst making these major transformations of society to create these new structures that we've talked about. And that's not easy. And frankly, not many CEOs are equipped for that. I think one of the main challenges that we have, because ultimately this is a leadership crisis more than anything else, is in fact not having enough leaders that we have prepared to deal with this environment that we've never had before. So this is where the challenge comes in. So I think the comments of the students were appropriate based on the case. I don't want to go into that in, in detail. Um, uh, you know, some, some of you, I think, are a little bit too much in, in, in smaller items and missing the bigger picture. Um, others are not really uh, fully seeing the trade-offs that you have to deal with in real life uh, to satisfy all these stakeholders. You cannot satisfy them all at the same time. That's why you want to have a longer-term model. Uh, but broadly, I think you hit the key challenges uh, of, of uh, transforming a business of this magnitude and uh, the pushback or skepticism that exists among uh, all of these different stakeholders, or at least parts of these stakeholders. And all you can do is communicate, bring them together, try to understand them, and try to find the, the solutions that are mutually acceptable. And we found in Unilever over time that uh, we gained to trust. We were uh, twice as trustworthy, even as companies like, um, like uh, Patagonia, uh, that we could form these partnerships and that these broader partnerships gave us the opportunities to actually drive a bigger and faster changes than we otherwise would have. With the benefit of hindsight, you know, we stayed our course. We actually stepped it up. The 10 years gave us 300% shareholder return, out, out, outperforming our competitors. I know we fall short on climate change and water, but, you know, um, frankly, for Unilever, these numbers were driven by acquisitions we made. We got uh, very fast into the hair care business in the US, for example, with Alberto Culver, lots of hairsprays, uh, lots of products with water use, like uh, shampooing. Uh, our own usage was actually going down quite significantly, but it shows you what a challenge is it to drive the consumer changes. And it shows you also how important it is to get governments to be with you and to put the right uh, regulations in place to drive these bigger changes. We never succeeded on getting rid of deforestation in all of our value chains. Uh, we probably were better than all of the competitors combined, but we still had major issues. You get a person like Bolsonaro in Brazil who actively deforest, uh, uh, drives deforestation in his country, uh, basically on, on populism. It's very hard for companies alone to do something about it. Uh, so you work very hard with the European governments, for example, uh, on, on trade agreements like Mercosur to ensure that no product can enter Europe that comes from deforestation. Just as an example to show you how you have to work with governments. Many governments still give heavy subsidies to fossil industry. The US during COVID gave as much money to the fossil industry than to green energy because of the lobbying you know half of the 4.5 billion money of lobbying that goes into washington comes from the fossil fuel industry and the government right now is clearly not strong enough with a, a small majority or i would argue was mentioned no majority at all to really pass the, the right things but if you don't get the legislation and the governments to move ultimately you will not get these broader systems changes it's difficult for companies um, to to um, deny that so they need to be active part of that. And it's also difficult for companies to make the bigger changes by themselves um, and, and be held accountable for that. You know, the comments on plastics in the oceans is right, but no company alone can solve the issue of plastics in the oceans or, or set up recycling systems uh, by themselves. If you don't have governments and if you don't work together, like Europe now does with the circular economy package, for example, or the, re, the prohibition of single use plastic and other things, you'll never get there. So this new way of working, these broader partnerships, driving these bigger systems changes are becoming 10 times more important. And that requires trust and trust requires you to earn a seat at the table to show that your company is real and doing things to work in a, a big level of transparency to set targets that are truly needed and to have leadership that has the courage 
to say and some of the things I don't know how to get there. I need your help to be there. But I know that the targets I set are the right targets because these are the targets that the world needs, not the targets I can get away with. For Unilever, it was never, I was never worried about hitting all these targets or not because we set absolute targets of zero waste, zero carbon emission, uh, living wages in our total value chain. I just wanted to be sure that whatever we did was under the mindset that we needed to do what the world needed. And as a result, I believe that a company like Unilever ended up in a much better place than it otherwise would have been, despite not hitting all these targets. And some targets actually overachieved. But the thing I'm most proud of is that at the end of the day, we reached 1.3 billion consumers and improved their livelihoods. That's more than a country like India or China can do, or I would argue the two of them can do combined. And I've always said that the true definition of a billionaire is not having a billion dollars in your bank, but touching a billion people to improve their lives. And I'm proud of the fact that I think we have shown increasingly that business can be that force for good and that there are different business models that can be successful beyond the simple model of shareholder primacy that frankly increasingly is being uh, is being discredited so that's a long story to say that uh, that the group very well understands the challenges the trade-offs the dilemmas that are there and that it in order to solve these enormous challenges which you all seem to agree on it requires a, a lot of time to bring these different parties together to seek that common ground and that understanding to move forward on these bigger changes that we need. Over to you. Paul, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's uh, uh, just uh, make some noise here. Paul. I think there's so much that you just said. Um, I just wanted to have two boards to uh, write uh, what I could. Um, I think I could have written on the wall and uh, I'm not out of space. Uh, the true definition of a billionaire is uh, not somebody who's got a billion in the bank that can reach a billion people and change their lives. Very different from um, a billionaire who uh, might look to buy a social media platform that has half a billion followers, half of whom are bots. But that's a different definition of a billionaire. But we won't go there. Uh, Paul, there are so many recurring themes in your observations. I'd like to just touch on a few of them, and I also see the connections across them. So the word systems change came up repeatedly. Um, now, the moment I hear systems change, I think all of us get excited because we like complexity and we appreciate complexity. And uh, we realize that uh, this is hard, and uh, which is what excites us and, and, and in many ways inspires us. But systems change is hard because systems change means many different parties with individual interests and motivations are connected and you somehow have to disentangle a status quo and reestablish a new equilibrium in many ways so changing that system is complicated but you said another thing which is very meaningful which is the costs of not acting are greater than the costs of taking action today now that's appealing to the rationalist among us. Okay. cost benefit analysis from a social standpoint. However, one of the interesting things about the difference between the costs of not acting and the costs of acting are that the people who are bearing the costs are different. The costs of not acting accrue to society. So when we have a, a global warming, the costs of possibly born not even the societies we live in here in north america or in europe but places in the global south or parts of the world that are already underwater whereas the costs of taking action are private costs they have to be borne by the companies they have to be borne by the ceos of the companies they have to be borne by all this the shareholders and uh, employees and uh, the suppliers who are all um, you know skeptical in, in the room so there's a challenge here in terms of the costs and who's bearing the costs. I think this is where the role of leaders becomes critical because you can see the mathematical equation at a macro level, but at a micro level to get systems to change, I need the individual actors to change their behaviors. 
Now, the individual actors, their incentives are not aligned. So this is where I need leaders. And by leaders, it's not just the leaders who are CEOs or founders of exciting companies, big or small, but companies that are themselves leaders, companies like Unilever, which can create awareness and potentially pull the industry along, pull the supply chain along, and thereby radiate change up and down the system. And this is where the theme that uh, describes this class is the theme of authority. What does the role of, a, of a, a company that has, or an enterprise that has authority, what role does it play in, in, in creating this ripple effect? Now, I also thought it was interesting, you're, yeah, you're mentioning Patagonia, which is almost not the polar opposite of Unilever, but in many ways so different from Unilever that they offer a different example. So Unilever, a publicly traded company, very much in the public view, its operations are transparent. It has to be, even though you uh, put aside quarterly guidance, you're still under pressure from analysts and uh, from stakeholders across the system, across 190 countries. Patagonia, on the other hand, a private company. And essentially, they do pretty much what they want, as long as they make great products, and as long as people are willing to pay the high prices for their products. And Patagonia's products are aimed at a tiny sliver of the population, whereas uh, Life Boy Soap sells in 190 countries, I think, or maybe, you know, maybe even more. So very interesting difference between the different kinds of companies. So it's a long-winded way of asking you a simple question, which is, how does one break in? How does one break the system? Where does one start? Is it better to start as Patagonia, where you're private and you're each an art? And you say, well, I'm a dirt bag and I can just do what I want. And uh, as long as I'm selling success, I'm, I'm a successful business uh, person, uh, people will just follow me. Or is it better to start as a giant, giant like Unilever and then try and effect change in a public way? Uh, no, the reality, uh, Bashkar, is that that you need both this uh, this pull from the top and the push from the bottom. And I think a lot of this broader systems changes that we've seen in society can happen at both levels. You know, I would argue that uh, the Mandela's or the Gandhi's or the Rosa Parks or the Martin Luther King were, were to some extent systems change drivers from the bottom up. But on the other hand, for example, Frank uh, Roosevelt with his New Deal was a systems change driver from the top down. To move the financial markets to the longer term, we'll need a top down approach. It will need a rethinking of our financial system, of our, our legislation around that. And that would probably be one thing. Uh, going into a broader accounting system to drive systems change, like um, accounting not only for the return on financial capital, but also on the return on social and environmental capital that will be a, a top-down approach more than a bottom-up approach. One of the reasons they established the Sustainable Standard Board or, or now some of the changes you see evolving in the US. So I think systems change will come from, from both sides. And the most important thing is, and in fact, I think is uh, because it is so difficult, because there is an inherent resistance to this broader systems change, uh, it requires a critical mass of the right people. Uh, you don't need more than 20 to 25% of a sector to drive a change that is ultimately good for society to win the confidence of the public and, uh, and work together with the public then to drive the needed policy changes. So you just need to be very careful on the coalitions you form to drive the right uh, systems change. And that is based on coalitions that operate on a high level of trust, on shared objectives, of full transparency and accountability, a continuous feedback loops, clear understanding what each and every party brings to the coalition. And in Unilever, we've been relatively successful uh, to create these coalitions and drive them, uh, whilst the reality is that many of these partnerships in the world are proving to be very difficult. But if you carefully nurture them, and if you operate with that higher level of trust and credibility that I keep referring to, I think you can increase your chances to be successful. I think we fundamentally changed Indonesia on deforestation. 
The country is putting in some of the best numbers it has ever shown over the last 30 years in declining deforestation. Uh, and, and we should be proud of that. I think we're getting to that now on regenerative agriculture, moving from land degradation and, and soil poverty to enriching the soil again and making it a, a strategy of, of restoring our biodiversity. I think we see the systems changes happening in, in mobility, as I talked about, where we are fundamentally changing well before we have uh, estimated uh, our mobility system and, and get out of the combustion engine. And so, so it's technology helps, uh, the burning issues that society and the cost that society faces helps. Um, and, and coming back to your point on uh, winners and losers of these transitions, or some make the investments and others get the benefits, obviously there is an increasing area where the ones that make the investments, I would argue, also have the benefits. Uh, business cannot succeed in failing societies. So it's in the benefit of business to invest in all these things. But I also think it's an ideal opportunity as we drive these broader systems changes that we keep the people in mind that are poor, that are still living on less than $5 a day, that have, don't have access to energy. And that in these transitions, we have what people call a just transition, a fair transition, an inclusive transition and set as a clear objective to reduce the inequality. A world where too many people feel they're not participating or where they're left behind ultimately will rebel against itself. I think that's one of the problems. So inequality is a other side of, of climate change, but it's the same coin. So how do we provide health, universal health care to everybody? How do we give everybody energy access? How do we provide education for everybody? These are things that, yes, I know will ultimately benefit society, but by benefiting society, it will also ultimately benefit the companies who have to be successful in these societies. So I think they're integrally linked, but any policy change that governments do have to always ensure that, um, that we address the issues of inequality or just transition. Uh, Australia is now discovering that nobody wants coal anymore, thank God. So the coal mines are being closed, but uh, they need uh, six times more jobs in green energy. So they don't have enough laborers in Australia. So they need to be sure that the coal miner is not unemployed, but that they spend a lot of money or enough money on retraining the coal miners to become uh, employed in the green energy. So that's what we call a just transition. And likewise, in, um, in um, the more emerging markets that you refer to, uh, we, it's in our interest that we spend some money collectively on helping these countries adapt to this new world, uh, convert to a greener economy, especially when they cannot tap into the financial markets themselves. Because if we don't, we're all going to pay the price for it. The climate change or the pandemic or some of the other issues that we deal with don't have any borders and uh, they are global issues that we need to take global responsibility for and i think more and more businesses are willing to do that look at how many businesses are willing to give up their their business success in in russia because of the atrocities that russia is committing in the ukraine they implicitly are saying i don't want to finance that i don't want to be there anymore some are taking a cut in their business by 10 15 percent by the way none have seen their share price go down you know, the companies that saw their share prices go down were the companies that continue to stay in Russia, that increasingly were subject to broader boycotts from consumer groups outside of Russia, who, that, who understood that by supporting these companies, you indirectly support the war and be complicit to it. So increasingly, we're starting to see that businesses that play that more important role of also becoming societal leaders are actually getting rewarded for that. Uh, by even the financial market and, and, and get it translated into higher value creation. Yeah, I think the, uh, the Russia uh, uh, invasion, uh, you know, is, uh, is almost an interesting litmus test in terms of uh, businesses making decisions. You know, some of them made them uh, pretty early. Others took their time. And yet others were led away from Russia kicking and screaming. And a few others probably uh, made a few uh, tricks with uh, uh, renaming their organizations and country and so on and so forth. But it's very interesting that companies like BP, for instance, you know, lost 
you know, close to a quarter of its market value by abandoning its projects in Russia. Paul, I know it's incredibly late for you, but do you have a few more minutes just for questions? I know that there's so many questions here. Can we, can we borrow 10 more minutes of your, of your time? Yeah, yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead. Okay, fantastic questions from the room. Come on, all right, Shruti, please. Uh, Hello, Paul. Uh, my name is Shruti. I'm an international business student here at Fletcher. Thank you so much for this inspiring talk. My question to you is based on your talk. You said that every sector must have this coalition of the, of the top 25% players to ensure that sustainability becomes a way of life. My question to you is, how did you start uh, building this consensus between uh, different players in the market uh, over the issue of sustainability? Um, and how do you ensure that competitors do not um, do not go in different ways. Let's say Unilever is uh, investing in sustainability, while other big players like PNG do not prioritize this. Uh, how do you compete with them then? Yeah, some of that will always happen, you know. And uh, when we moved to sustainable palm oil, and we started buying sustainable palm oil certificates and investing a lot in converting the plantations to sustainable palm oil, it undoubtedly cost us fifteen to twenty million dollars a year to do that. And some of our competitors were just sitting on the sideline. But I think increasingly we saw that uh, we created more resilient supply chains. When it moved to sustainable sourcing, it actually had a higher yield and better livelihood. So it created a, a more robust and resilient uh, value chain and actually lower prices over time. And, and some of the methods that we used was uh, calling out those competitors and in fact, using NGOs to attack those competitors. It's interesting. But in the 10 years in Unilever, we were never really too much criticized by, by the NGO community. It mainly went to our competitors. And I think it ultimately helped build the, the Unilever brand. But you know, uh, the, the reality is more and more issues are uh, becoming pre-competitive. I always say you should not compete on the future of humanity. The, the, a big part of the industry now understands that the issue of plastics in the oceans is an issue of the industry. It's not an individual company issue. Just to say that my bottles are recycled or from recyclable plastic doesn't mean anything anymore. There's plastics in the oceans. And as long as that is there, every plastic piece of plastic will be filified. So uh, issues like human rights, I mean, these are not issues that we should compete on or issues of corruption. We should not compete on that. So increasingly these organizations which are being asked to play a bigger role in changing society, 75, 80% of, of citizens expect companies that have a higher trust and governments, by the way, to play an active role, that they are moving together on these uh, issues of, of, of common interest or, or in fact, what I call always the future of humanity. At the COP26 in Glasgow, you saw that on climate change with coalitions like the race to zero, race to zero breakthrough, um, race to resilience, where actually coalitions of companies often by industry sector were far more ambitious than the, than the countries themselves in their submissions. And I think as the secretary general said as well, uh, it not only shamed some of the countries, but it probably accelerated some of the policies that countries are now putting in place to, to close that gap. So I think it's these type of um, uh, areas are increasingly uh, coming together. Um, I work on, on several industries that have the biggest impact on the sustainable development goals, the energy transition, obviously, but then actually the fashion industry, uh, the food industry, tourist and travel, are big industries uh, that that really have a, a very devastating impact on on the world in, in terms of planetary boundaries or livelihoods, if you want to. But all of these industries have enough CEOs in there that understand that the future of their industry is at risk if they don't change that. But they also understand that they can't do it alone. So in fashion, we bring everybody together to get out of single use plastics in, in B2B to collectively buy green energy, to collectively go to regenerative cotton. None of these companies can do that alone. They're too small. They don't know how to work the broader system, but collectively you can. If I have a group of um, 70 fashion companies now together, representing 30% of the industry, then uh, people like uh, Macron or Biden or, 
or uh, Timmermans here in Europe uh, are willing to listen to you and are willing to work together to put the right uh, frameworks and 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 uh, things in place. And ultimately, it's better for the industry. And and yeah, you you will always have uh, 50, 60 percent that sits on the sideline or 20 percent that is against it in any industry. But I think with that critical mass of 30 percent nowadays uh, around these broader issues of humanity, you, you really can drive these bigger systems changes. Great, thank you for that. And thank you for the question. Uh, uh, Paul, just a quick uh, a little pitch here. Uh, Suthi is part of uh, a, a four woman uh, team. Uh, three of the women are here in class with us, Shruti, Aria, and uh, Kathy, uh, who uh, designed a new sustainable packaging for Dove soap. And uh, mm -hmm. they came up, uh, became second in uh, worldwide competition. So, all right. Others. Excellent. Hello, Mr. Paul. My name is Gaurav. I'm a first year more student here at Pitchett. Thank you for the inspirational talk and thank you for the book as well. I'm sure that many of us, we are getting inspiration from that. My question is that whenever we talk about sustainability and net positive, we are also focusing on the the world's middle class family group, because that group is going to impact heavy when it comes to save the planet Earth, because that group is the one who is consuming the product most as well. When we talk about the products that we are selling at the higher price, of course, for the rich, it's easy to buy. But when it comes to middle class, it's a difficult and for the lower middle class is even more difficult. How do you see that products can be more affordable so that we can go in this direction forward. Thank you. Yeah, I personally am of the opinion that um, most of the issues that we need to solve actually don't result in a higher uh, uh, cost. Uh, the, the the notion that um, sustainability uh, cost money is probably true for some things, uh, or, or investments might have to be made upfront uh, instead of later. Um, but frankly, I, I think for most of the issues, we are past that point. We can um, provide more nutritious food, healthier food, if you want to, um, at a lower cost in a more sustainable way than what we currently do. If you look at the cost of deforestation, of food waste, of degrading the land, uh, and, and all the issues that are related to that, the costs are infinitely higher. Um, we are close to the point that electric vehicles are cheaper than uh, combustion engines so there's always this little curve that you need to go over um, and, and get to critical mass um, but i think if we um, put uh, enough people behind that and sometimes with the help of governments etc uh, most of the time these cost curves are surprising us 70 80 percent of the world right now has cheaper green energy than fossil energy it's certainly the case now of Obviously, was the enormous increases we've seen in energy prices. So I think um, whilst we have to be mindful that um, that we protect uh, and improve the living standards of the lower and middle class, um, it is actually increasingly easier to design for that group of people something that is more sustainable than converting the more fasted economies of Europe and the US, which is proving to be more difficult always more difficult to change an incumbent than to you know to to disrupt by uh, by by the newcomers um, so inherently i think in the way that uh, china is now being built up in its public transport in its mobility systems and others it has a better design in there structurally to attack sustainability i would argue than the us has for example in africa we now have an opportunity to ensure that the energy we need to provide or the agriculture that we need to bring back to the continent is done in a sustainable way. The World Economic Forum calculated that uh, with the help of BCG, Boston Consulting Group, that if um, all of the value chains in every industry sector would move to full sustainable value chains, it would be nine to 16% cheaper. You know, think about it. Right now, only 8% of all the materials we produce is reused. The rest ends up in landfills, incineration, or as we talk increasingly in the oceans. That's just absurd. 
that we only reuse 8% of everything we use. And most of the things we use have a negative effects on, on, on our nature, on our natural habitat on which we depend. This provides us over $45 trillion of free services, by the way. And increasingly, we're starting to see the cost of those things coming in. So designing it now better is, um, in most cases, going to be actually cheaper and more affordable for this rising uh, middle class that you're referring to. Now, in the cases where that is difficult to achieve, we either need to wait a little bit longer for more discontinuous technology or design differently, or we need to change some government policies that redirect. You know, $1.8 trillion is still in subsidies, $1.8 trillion in subsidies that degrade land or that stimulate fossil fuel. It's absurd. So if we can make governments clear, which are often very compartmentalized, but if we can make clear to governments that these subsidies should be directed to greening our society, I think it goes a long way to helping the poor end as well. Right now, we don't even have 100 billion for the Green Climate Fund. We can't even have the, the courage to give them vaccines. Uh, and we're hoarding them ourselves in the West as if it's nothing. Uh, that's a cost of 50 to 75 billion. Here I'm talking about 1.8 trillion. You literally, literally can redesign whilst saving the lives of the poorer people. We are now working, for example, I'm on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation to give you a concrete example. And um, with foundations like the Bezos Foundation, IKEA Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, some of the multilateral finance institutions, we have uh, $10 billion in concessionary financing, which could be first loss, which could be blended, if you're familiar with these terms. We can leverage that up now with the private sector by taking these risks away. We can leverage that up to about $100, $110 billion and make it attractive for private money to flow into these areas, in this case, the area of energy poverty. 800 million people in the emerging markets don't have access to energy, 1.3 billion people intermittent energy. With this fund that we have now set up, we take the risks away for the private sector, we attract it, we attract the needed funds, and we can solve the issue of energy poverty for 800 million people. That's a tremendous uh, uh, change that can happen by a combination of partnerships, policy change, um, and, uh, and, and focusing on, on what it is all all about providing livelihoods to to everybody in this world and making this an inclusive world ultimately this world will not function uh, if we don't have uh, a system that provides uh, dignity and respect for everybody equity or if we don't operate with a certain level of compassion uh, i've always said that the real issues that we have not to get sidetracked the real issues that we have frankly are not uh, issues of climate change or or food security or poverty. These are symptoms. The real issue we have is one of greed, of apathy, of selfishness. That's why this is a leadership crisis at all levels. And that's why it's actually solvable. The latest IPCC report also came out uh, saying that we could still stay below one and a half degrees, but we have to act together and do that with a level of responsibility. The report even pointed out for the first time that it's actually cheaper to do that than if we don't do it and, and bear the consequences. So we're at this important point right now in the history of human mankind that we need to pull through, that we don't, uh, that we need to watch that things like COVID or the war in the Ukraine or the high prices of energy don't push us in the wrong direction, but actually accelerate us in the right direction. It's starting to happen in Europe. It's starting to actually happen in places like uh, India and China, which have come a long way in this discussion. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, but it, it, it takes a lot what we're asking for. We need to have six times faster uh, investments in, in uh, electric vehicles. We need uh, five, six times faster investment in, in solar and wind. These are step changes uh, at a scale that we've never done before. Uh, and yet we have the money, by the way. It's not a question of money. It's a question of uh, deploying it in the right way. And I think uh, that's, that's where the private sector again, once more, um, can play a major role, not only convincing governments, but also themselves putting their money behind it to, to 
be proud and hopefully 10 years, 15 years from now, and say we solved the world's problems, we didn't leave you with bigger problems, by all means possible. Well, Paul, I think um, we, are, uh, we agree with you, it's a leadership crisis and that's why we're here. Uh, we run a leadership factory at Fletcher and uh, it's important for us to hear from you so that uh, um, uh, we can uh, you know, uh, inspire uh, the leaders uh, who will step onto the stage. Uh, that is a bit of a mess right now, uh, but uh, we will give them the tools to clean up the mess. And so thank you for uh, helping us uh, uh, get an understanding of what it takes uh, to clean up the mess, uh, you know, once again, recreating awareness of the mess and how you did it, uh, at least played your part uh, in, in, in Unilever. Uh, thank you so much. It is very late. Uh, the internet is also sending us a message saying your yeah. bandwidth is low. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll, let you, uh, we'll let you say uh, uh, good, good night and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you again, Paul Bolden. Thank you.